Hello and welcome to this Bristol Ideas online event celebrating the life and work of the great Diana Wynne-Jones. Lovely to have you all with us, uh, hundreds of you here from literally all around the globe as far as we can tell. We've just been scrolling through the list of messages already. I'm seeing Minnesota, I'm seeing Texas, Italy, Malaysia, Japan, Leeds, Cambridge, anywhere you could think of, some glamorous, some less glamorous, all highly valued. Uh, lots to talk about, of course, about Dino and Jones this evening, but not the only glorious event we've got coming up on the Bristol Festival of Ideas. The programme is a mixture of online, like this one, and live events running right through the autumn. It continues to feature writers and thinkers from all over the world. You can sign up to the e-newsletter via the website, or you can follow Bristol Ideas on Twitter, so you can stay up to date on the latest events. This event will be available to watch again via Crowdcast as soon as we're finished. So if you're watching it now and you're somehow not completely saturated in an hour, hour or so's time, you can always watch back. Or if you've missed it or friends and family who couldn't make it, they can watch it back as well. The event has been organized with, co-organized rather, with St George's Bristol and Diana Wynne Jones's family, friends and fans, including her friend and literary executor Laura Cecil, academic Catherine Butler and research writers Henrietta Wilson and Lydia Wilson. You can of course ask questions. I was talking about the chat where you're from everywhere since I started speaking. We've now got people from Milton Keynes and Maine and New Zealand. Uh, so you can chat in there. There'll be moderators to talk to you, but you can also ask a question on the ask a question section and our panel will be dealing with those at the end. Talk of which, uh, I should probably introduce them. I am Johnny Burrow. I'm in that first category, I suppose, of Diana Wynne Jones's family. I'm one of her five grandchildren and I, absolutely loved her my i one of my very earliest memories full stop to be honest is my dad who is also here and we introduced shortly explaining to my twin brother gabriel and i that our grandmother was going to be called granark as a portmanteau of grandmother and anarchist once he finished explaining roughly what that was for a kid on grounds that she was a grandmother just like our other grandmother and just like everybody else's grandmother but she probably wasn't going to quite do it the way that everybody else's grandmother did it and she probably wasn't going to do it the way everybody thought she was meant to do it either both of those predictions were correct uh, she was all the better for it and as with all things in her life really she didn't do it the way she was meant to do it but it was glorious anyway i am by the way coming off the back of a truly terrible cold, not COVID, but if I start sounding a bit like a bomb villain, I can only apologize. I don't have anything drastically interesting to say about Diana Wynne Jones's work, to be honest, apart from the fact that I grew up with her books and I love them almost as much as I loved her. But luckily, we've got a panel of people who really do. Colin Burrow is Diana Wynne Jones's youngest son. He's my dad as well. He's the proud dedicatee of her Eight Days of Luke and The Skyver's Guide, which is written for Colin, with whose help this book would never have been written. I think fair to say since then, he's got fairly more lively he does a bit more work now he's a senior literary critic he writes for the lrb he's a senior research fellow at all souls college oxford also spends a lot of time in his shed woodworking and losing to both of his sons at mario kart so there you go uh, we've also got mickey burrow with us who is diana's middle son uh, her, now her literary executor of course and joint dedicatee with her eldest son richard of the ogre downstairs he now lives in her house of many steps which we all still very much love and works in the software industry. Neil Gaiman, we were talking about very diverse locations. It is seven in the morning for you roughly, Neil, joining us all the way from New Zealand, which is very, very kind of you. Of course, needs no introduction, author of books for children and adults, award-winning across the board, titles including Norse Mythology, American Gods, The Graveyard Book, and of course, the Sandman graphic novels. He's been making some telly recently rather a lot of it and i've been seeing clips on netflix images stills and video of an upcoming netflix series of sandman so lots of exciting things in the pipeline there he was a close friend of dino and jones's a protege confidant co-conspirator all the rest of it fascinated to hear what he has to say and last but 
absolutely certainly not least, is Catherine Rundle, who is the author of half a dozen award-winning children's books, among them Rooftoppers, The Explorer, and The Good Thieves, and a very short book for adults, Why You Should Read Children's Books Even Though You Are So Old and Wise, which a friend of mine actually gave to me a couple of years ago, and I was sold. I was reading them anyway, it has to be said, so possibly preaching to the choir, but it was glorious. So very lovely to be speaking to you. Catherine, of course, is also a fellow of All Souls College Oxford, where she works on the poetry of John Donne, a love which began in part when she came across one of his poems transformed into a spell in the pages of Howl's Moving Castle. Glorious to have you all with us. All of the speakers are going to be speaking individually, then having a kind of group discussion at the end, responding to your questions. First up, I think we're going to hear from Neil Gaiman and Mickey Burrow about, of course, their shared love of Diana and their own bizarre meeting, as far as I can tell. That's right. Um, I, um, I first met Neil in the uh, 1988 World Fantasy Con in some dismal hotel not far from Heathrow. Uh, we were sharing a room which Diana had booked. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, basis she booked it. She probably told Neil that she'd already booked it for me and she told me that she'd already booked it for Neil. Me, for, But uh, it's typical of her that uh, she's very generous in, in, in uh, helping anybody to go anywhere really. Um, the um, Diana was always encouraging younger authors, and I think Neil was at that point was quite a young author. He was the same; age, he's exactly the same age as me, and uh, was just embarking on your career. I think at that point, weren't you, Neil? In about 1988, you'd probably written your first couple of books by then, hadn't you? And uh, anyway, um, so what's your memories of that time? Um. Yes, that was about um, three weeks before the first issue of Sandman was due to come out. I was definitely doing things on a budget and Diana definitely told me that, yes, uh, oh, she had a room for Mickey. Why didn't I use that instead of trekking backwards and forwards to Sussex every night? And uh, I, I accepted with incredible joy. I was, I was absolutely broke at that time and I remember missing the banquet uh, because I couldn't afford the banquet that month however um, what I heard about the chicken and the avocados at that banquet actually made me kind of pleased that I'd hung out in the bar instead. Uh, um, I don't remember anything about the banquet at all probably it's been blanked off is from my memory. I'm not sure whether that fancy Kong is as uh, contributed at all to Deep Secret, which is sort of based around the fancy con. Uh, probably not. It's, I think it was a later one. What do you think? I think deep, uh, I'm not sure. I know that Deep Secret, she, she told me the, at one point the various ingredients of Deep Secret, that it was, it was a different hotel because the, um, she said the geometry of it just didn't work. And also, for some reason, you'd start out on one floor and then you'd be on another, which made getting from place to place very difficult. But she stole one thing um, in Deep Secret from me, which was uh, one of our first, not our first meeting, um, but times we got to spend a lot of time together was at the Milford Science Fiction Writers Workshop in a little town called Milford, somewhere near... I don't know, Southampton or Bournemouth or somewhere. Um, and uh, I was, I, I didn't respond. I was not a morning person. And, no, I remember um, that. And by sort of Thursday, you know, the first day I was great at getting up at whatever time it was that we had to get up. We had to be up for breakfast, which was served at eight. And if you were not at that 8 a.m. breakfast, there was no food until one in this weird little seaside hotel that was just about to close down and just had us in. Um, and it was fine on the Monday. Tuesday, I was there, but sleepy. Wednesday, I was there, but bleary. Thursday, I basically was, I, according to Diana anyway, from whom I, I heard the story, um, I turned up at the table essentially asleep and just people put food in front of me and I ate. 
And when I finished the rather sad breakfast, um, Mary Gentle, who was also sitting next to me and hadn't wanted her breakfast, just put her breakfast plate to see what I'd do and I continued eating. Um, and then apparently I looked up and said very sadly, I've already eaten this breakfast once and I didn't like it the first time. And Diana stole that and created yeah. Nick in Deep Secrets and gave him my breakfast. Yes, I remember that scene very well. That's one of my favourite books, Deep Secret. Uh, and, and to be fair on that, if there was one thing that Diana absolutely loved, it was someone who ate far too much and repeatedly and would simply not stop. I mean, if you kept eating, if the story I was told was my godfather, the first time he went to their house in Bristol, they had a relatively small roast duck for too many people. And he, having never met them before, when he'd finished, stood up and just picked the carcass up and started gnawing it. And most people's mums would go, what are you doing? Who do you think you are? How are you behaving in this way? Apparently she absolutely loved it and never let him forget it. Um, so I'm sure eating too many breakfasts can only go one way with her, Neil. Well, I, uh, I, I think it was definitely a popular move to have made. But that was, that was the first time Mickey and I met. Um, mm. I'd known Diana at that point, I think for about three years. Um, cause we'd met at the, uh, actually at another convention at the British fantasy convention that she was a guest of honor of, um, in 85 or 86. And she later told me much, much later, um, that I was the first adult human being who was neither a teacher nor a librarian nor in publishing to tell her that he read and liked her books um and that was merely coincidence because i was in the bar i got to the convention slightly early i was in the bar she turned up early went into the bar i walked over to her and said oh my god you're diana Jones. i love what you do and started talking about her books and years later, she said, you know, until that convention, the only people who'd actually told me they'd like my books were people who did it professionally. You were the first adult fan. And whether it was true or not, I never cared. It was no, such a lovely oh, thing to hear. That, that is a lovely thing. And of course, then throughout the rest of her life, she had many people eventually telling her that they loved her books and you of course have that now as well uh, glorious to talk to you both glorious to hear that first meeting story we're going to be hearing a lot more from neil later in the show uh, our first speaker on their own is colin burrow uh diana's youngest son uh fellow at all souls oxford's as stated writer for the lrb and all the rest of it take us away thanks thanks very much johnny uh very good to see you and hear you albeit gruffly um, I, I wanted to start just by talking a little bit about that wonderful photograph of mum that's been used as the cover image for this, the publicity for this event, where she's sitting in her favourite writing chair and she's got Caspian, her, well, her most beloved dog, uh, sitting at her feet. Um, he is, of course, the original of Dog's Body um, uh, and was truly the prince of her heart. And she wrote most of her books sitting in that chair uh, curled up in a world of her own and she'd have a pen in one hand uh, and she'd have coffee in another hand and then she'd have a cigarette in another hand and she was a bit magical um, and uh, that image of her sitting there writing writing she wrote longhand with a pen with the words just flowing out was such a vision of just pure human happiness for me to see her there and it's truly wonderful that such a, a, a sort of self-absorbed and self-contained writing posture should have produced so many books that have made so many people happy all around the world. I just think it's a, it's a really wonderful thing. And I think that image of her in the chair also says something about the way her imagination worked, really, because she loved to create autonomous worlds, completely self-contained universes which had their own rules and which stuck to the, their rules on their own terms and she was like a lot of fantasy writers but i think in in a way that goes beyond a lot of fantasy writers a world builder and a world constructor uh, and that's a real part 
of her power, just getting lost in her own world. But the other thing about her, which is particularly apparent to somebody who was in her family, was that she was a great reimaginer and redescriber of the world around her. Uh, and so if you shared experiences with her, as Nia was described, you'd sometimes see them coming back in a transfigured way in, in fiction. Uh, and her fiction, as well as being uh, a matter of world making, was also a kind of enchanted and refracting glass where you'd see things in the world amplified and distorted and, and uh, with a sort of rainbow of colour around them. And she could do that with people. So, you know, my dad was the worst possible patient. If he'd had a cold as bad as Johnny's, uh, he would have been sneezing in a way that would shatter most people's uh, speakers on their laptops. He would have been waving handkerchiefs around. He'd have been groaning about death imminently. Um, and all of that, of course, becomes the the magical cold of, of Wizard Howl in Howl's Moving Castle, where green magical slime flows forth from this histrionic male. Uh, you know, his dad, completely. Um, and there are other very striking examples of where she sort of sees through to the heart of a scene and transforms it into fiction. So uh, in The Homeward Bounders, the character Helen, who's one of the um, sort of pr priestess goddess uh, um, from the East that mum very much liked to imagine. Um, she has a fringe that comes down like this, so you can see only her, the tip of her very sharp nose. And she's very spiky and she only likes insects. Well, she she is a friend of mine uh, or, um, who was a great lover of war games, who had fair hair and was a man. But nonetheless, he is Helen. He didn't have the ability to turn his right hand into an elephant's trunk or a, or a sword with which to slay demons. But he was someone who, you know, if anyone could, he, he would have done. So she did transform people and she also transformed places. So we went on a lot of family holidays to the Lake District, which is famously wet and misty and vertiginous. And mum was very afraid of heights and we'd go on walks where she would be terrified. She'd sort of see the landscape falling away from beneath her. Uh, and we'd also often get lost. Uh, and we'd often almost have to carry her past these uh, crags and, and, uh, and, and hillsides uh, because she was so in the grip of fear. And all of that becomes the space between universes in the Crestomancy books, that, that, those great voids where you have to watch your footing and you don't quite know where you're going and you're terrified. And it, you know, it, it, it just an extraordinary act of transformation. So she wrote a, a kind of fantasy which was in its strange way, very true to life, or at least life as she saw it. She didn't always see reality in the same way as everybody else and um, didn't always see the same reality as me. She certainly believed, and it wasn't just a joke, that she had a travel jinx. And that meant that whenever she went on the M25, which for those of you who aren't in the UK, is the orbital road that goes around London and which is always horrendously congested. But whenever mum went on the M25 and it was horrendously congested, it was because of her travel jinx. So, you know what? Maybe on Wednesday it was also pretty congested there. Um, and she also sometimes transformed people into fiction uh, in ways that suggested that she didn't see those people in the same way as me. And that was particularly true of her mother, with whom she had what we could politely call a very complicated relationship. Uh, and I think, I mean, she, she not only thought her mother was a bad mother, but I think she also genuinely thought that her mother had stolen something really profound from her like her childhood um, and it was a it was a very sort of painful relationship and obviously mum's mum was my granny and I quite liked my granny and so seeing her represented as she is uh, transparently really as, as Gamma Pinho in the Pinho egg as a sort of wiki witch who creates a plague of fleas and a uh, whooping cough and causes a war between clans of witches uh, and at the same time casts a spell on everybody so that nobody knows it's her fault. You know, that, 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 was, that was quite hard and transformative. But I think the genuine pain that she did feel about her own childhood was 
really fundamental to all of her fiction. And what I think was sort of heroic about her really was that she was absolutely determined to turn all that hurt into creativity and humor. And she did that to a remarkable degree. And, and, and dad always used to say that she was a classic instance really of the wound and the bow as Edmund Wilson called it. And, and that is, is alluding to Philoctetes who's the greatest Greek archer, who's also got a terrible wound on his foot and is suffering agonizing pain from it the whole time. And that combination of suffering and power, I think really was um, how her imagination uh, worked. And the particular pain about her own childhood, I think contributed three at least really big features of her fiction, which are consistent features of her fiction. The first is a sort of obvious one, which, which her difficult relationship with her mother meant that she really brought the um, fairy tale cliche of the Wicked Witch to life, you know, chillingly. There are these cold, manipulative older women who are really trying to destroy the younger generation. Uh, again and again in her fiction, there's the Witch of the Waste in Hell's Moving Castle who steals Sophie's beauty and health fr from her and makes her somebody whom nobody notices. Um, and that is actually an extraordinarily powerful component in her fiction, although it's it's quite an unsettling one. The other the other thing I think it gives her is 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 a real passion for slightly vague, vain, but extremely powerful men. Uh, so uh, Howl, Wizard Howl, is one of the characters I think who readers of her work fall in love with, and Mum created him because she needed those sorts of men. And then another vain, vague, powerful man is, of course, Crestomancy with his um, his dressing gowns. I'll put my Crestomancy dressing gown on. Uh, I've only got one. I haven't got one for each day of the week. I hope you're all wearing your Crestomancy dressing gowns at home. Um, but she really needed that glamour of masculinity, I think, to sort of offset her, her uneasy attitudes to her own mother and her own past. But the third really key thing that came, as it were, from the wound um, was her preoccupation in her fiction with fairness uh, in a profound way. So her books again and again are about people who have enormous powers but don't realise it, who are having them stolen from them surreptitiously by somebody in the background. And to get that power back, what they've got to do is firstly, notice that they're being manipulated. And secondly, do something to get to get that power back. And that's often the so often the narrative energy of the stories. It's there in Charmed Life, where um, uh, Gwendolyn is stealing Kat's nine lives and using using his power. And in the later fiction, it takes on a slightly different form it almost becomes a kind of environmentalism where there might be a wicked sorcerer in another universe next door to you who's stealing all the magic from your world who's stopping the birds singing who's who's taking away everything that makes your world alive and i think it's 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 that concern with fairness and not being manipulated by um somebody else which really makes her novels powerful and i think makes them particularly powerful actually for this generation who are in many ways having things taken away from them they're having material things taken away from them uh, in the form of wealth uh, but they're also having immaterial things taken away from them uh, opportunities opportunities to be imaginative and free and I, th I think you know all the wonderful things in her writing are about freedom and about granarchy um, she loves animals that won't obey the rules. She loves people who won't obey the rules. And she really, really admires and loves people who win back themselves from others. And that's the core of her writing. And, I th and it's really why I'm, I'm so proud to be one of her sons. I think she was absolutely terrific and really matters uh, now for that concern with fairness. Thank you.
she was an extraordinary person um very nicely spoken colin love lovely to be with you very much enjoyed it you'll be pleased to hear i was keeping an eye on the chat for you while listening they love your dressing gown there is huge respect for the dressing gown and there is also some poor soul in australia gin who says it's 4 a.m definitely in the dressing gown though still no crestamancy powers we've got another hour or so we'll, hopefully we'll have the powers by the end if not hold on to the dressing gown Colin will be back at the end for the Q&A with the whole panel. Lovely to hear from you. Up next, it is the glorious Catherine Rundle. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, so I am a children's writer. Um, and I think it isn't too much to say that Diana Wynne Jones changed my life entirely. Uh, but not necessarily in the children's writer way, but because I fell so in love with that poem, with the go and catch a falling star in Howl's Moving Castle. And I fell in love with the way she treated it, not as something that should be reverenced, but as something that had a kind of spark and a kind of aliveness. Um, and it was part of what I adored so much about her. Because as a kid, I first read uh, Charmed Life at about eight. I loved the way that she seized things from the adult world and pulled them into her books in a way that other writers just weren't doing, in that she had things that are very firmly relegated to other, like John Donne poetry. Also her kind of irony and her kind of sarcasm, um, her willingness to have these sort of strange, opaque moments, like at the end of Charmed Life, that thing where the magic happens and it happens in a great swirl and a great strange mist. I loved that she didn't spell it out entirely and that she demanded that you fill in the blanks and that you rise to it. And I loved so wildly her belief in the intellect of the people who were writing, who she was writing for. I think before her, historically, broadly speaking, there are exceptions, but mostly, I think people as good as Diana Wynne Jones thought they were too good for children. And I think one of the things she did was show that is just in no way the case. Um, and so I fell in love with John Donne in partly because of her. And then I wrote about him for my finals when I was an undergraduate at Oxford University. And then I sat an exam called the All Souls Fellowship exam. And I wrote mostly about, about John Donne during that exam. And if you pass that exam, two people pass it every year and they get to go to All Souls College. And when I got there, I was given a literary supervisor um, who I thought was a great Shakespeare scholar and a lecturer on Spencer. And he asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I'd like to write about John Donne, maybe do a PhD, but really I want to be a children's writer like Philip Pullman or Diana Wynne-Jones. And he said, Diana Wynne-Jones is my mother. Um, so I had got an entire circle and ended back up in front of Diana Wynne-Jones's son. Um, and I think when I write for children, I try to remember some of the things that she taught me, some of the extraordinary lessons which she just laid out for us. Um, the first book I read of hers was Charmed Life, but I went on to read all of them over and over and over again in a way that I think so many of her readers do. I think there is something in them that you become hungry for and that you return to. And I think it is the fact that they have the thing that Jane Austen has and that Shakespeare has, that they endlessly renew themselves. There is always something new to find in them because they are such rich stories. But most of all, I loved her for her refusal to talk down to children because the vast majority of literature has not understood that children can have enormous lives and rich, rich imaginations. I loved her for her unswerving refusal to explain things, her unapologetic quality. It felt to me like liberation. And it's something that I now have become a sort of proselytizer for. The idea that you can put words into books that children won't necessarily know, but they will either collect them, they will either find out what they mean, or they will just jump over them and come back for them later. Her vocabulary and the way that she writes, she had no truck at all with the idea that you should, you know, see spot run. She believed in sort of just unleashing herself into these books and it's a, uh, reading them as a child, it felt like being saluted by someone who believed in you. And I also loved her absolute resistance to cliche in a way that I think almost no other writer has been so brilliant in either subverting it or just mocking it. 
Um, and I don't know, I imagine this is the, one of the few places where people will have read her um, Tough Guide to Fantasyland, which I absolutely loved. And I've, I've copied a tiny little bit of it here because I love it so much. Um, it's sort of, it's a, for those who haven't come across it, it's a litany of definitions if you find yourself in a world of fantasy. Um, so for instance, stew, what you are served eat every single time. Clothing, here, the colder the climate, the fewer the garments worn. Missing heirs, at any given time, half the countries in fantasy land will have mislaid their crown prince or princess. Scurvy, Despite a diet consisting entirely of stew, see above, and whey bread, supplemented only by the occasional fish, see above, you will not suffer from this or any other deficiency disorder. Common cold. This is one of the many viral nuisances that will not be present. You can get as wet, cold, and tired as you like, and you will still not catch cold. But see, plague. Um, and I love that she doesn't do that. She has wizards with terrible colds. And I return to her consistently because she has a vision of the world that has no need to exclude the minor details. Instead, she has them make everything so much richer. There is also the element that Colin mentioned, which is that she is the creator of some of the sexiest characters for young women who are reading these books, and indeed young men, um, that you will ever encounter in children's fiction, her willingness to just unleash these male characters into the psyche of eight-year-old girls <laughs> has shaped so many of my friends forever. Of course, everyone wants to marry Hal, uh, but also the idea of Crestomancy with his dressing gown and with his calm authority and with his elegantly short temper he was for me the ideal man in a way that is not helpful as you work through the world but in a way which has lasted me forever and i also loved and i don't know i don't know if this is the same i certainly know it's the same for all the girls i know fire and hemlock is one of the strangest and most remarkable children's books that i have ever read it's a strange beast for those who don't know it, it's based on the story of Tam Lin. And in it, a girl who is 12 ends up at the end in love with the man who has been her friend and companion throughout. And it might well be that that is not a book that would fly now, but at the time it felt to me like an extraordinary way of thinking about the way you mature and about the way you obsess. It felt to me like a book which in its opacity left enormous amounts of space for choosing how to read it. Um, and of course, most 13 year old girls I know chose to read it by falling wildly in love with the elegant, distracted, slightly vain character of, Tam, of Thomas Lynn. Um, so I go to schools a lot. And one of the things that I get asked is, what is your favorite children's book that you didn't write? And I have always, always said, Charmed Life. And one of the things that gives me great joy is I've been doing this now for 12 years. And the number of children who have heard of Charmed Life has burgeoned in those 10 years. The number of them who have read it are in love with it has been absolutely exploding, I think in part because of the reissue of all the books. But I started right back at the beginning, 12 years ago, when people hadn't come across it in quite such numbers, I would offer a prize. I would say, OK, I have a bet for you. I think that there is no chance that you will not adore Charmed Life. Uh, and so if you read Charmed Life and you don't love it, you can write to me and I will send you chocolate in the post. And I got this glorious cascade of letters from children saying, dear Catherine Mungle, I read Charm Life and I regret to tell you that I absolutely loved it and it's my new favorite book. And they all come in exactly the same mechanism. They all uh, attempt to pull a, a, a sort of enchanting eight-year-old trick. Um, and then in the end, I got one letter from one boy who said, I read it, I don't believe in magic. It didn't really happen, I didn't like it. Um, and so to him, I grudgingly sent a bag of Maltesers and a secret wish that he would understand the concept of the imagination. <laughs> but he was the only one. And otherwise, I have just been the receiver of a staggering number of letters of children falling in love over and over again 
with Diana Wynne Jones's work and with her wit and with her irony and with her willingness to believe that we will follow her where she takes us and with that extraordinary gift of writing sentences that make you want to scream with jealousy. And I think that there is nobody like her in the last hundred years. I think she is utterly, utterly unique and my favorite children's writer ever. Catherine, that was wonderful. Thank you. Did, did you ever get a chance to meet her? I never did. No. She, she would have loved you. Honestly, she would have absolutely loved you. My only other question is, did the kids who liked the book get the Maltesers as well? Or did you really stick to your promise? They just got, they got them, but I would write back to them saying, I'm okay. so glad now we need to read The Magicians of Caprona and The Lives of Christopher Chant and Eight Days of Luke. And I would send them lists to so a few of them. I even sent books. So some of okay. them got the and a greater gift than Maltesers, I think. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, really lovely to hear from you. Catherine will, of course, be back as will Colin Burrow for the Q&A at the end. Before that, we go to the wonderful Neil Gaiman. He's got up early for us. He's ready for a chat and I cannot wait to hear what he's got to say. I think he's going to be with us very shortly. A very busy man, of course, with um, Sandman adaptation coming out on Netflix relatively shortly as well. The chat, hugely busy. Uh, I hope they got the off-brand Maltesers, uh, says Fee. And so do I. I. I completely agree with that. There are various people as well. One, one saying that Richard, Diana's oldest son, was actually their English teacher in year seven. And the, the, the link was made when they reviewed Howl's Moving Castle as their favourite book. And you'll say, I can't quite find the name. So I apologise whoever this was, uh, saying that they're absolutely mortified looking back as an adult. The only thing I could say is don't be. So straightforwardly, don't be. He would have loved it and she would have loved it even more. I remember very clearly, I was so proud to be her grandson always. So I'm very boring about it in a way that you want to talk about being retrospectively embarrassed about things. That's about number one for me. And eventually, when my twin brother and I were, I don't know, probably eight, nine years old, she came to my school as Catherine used to and gave a talk. And she told the story about being so focused on her writing that she put a roast chicken by the door for my granddad to put on his feet and put his walking boots in the oven. Um, and I just dined out on that, pardon the pun, for, for the rest of my school career. So nothing to be embarrassed about for anyone. One person she absolutely loved, always loved hearing from, and I'm going to love hearing from now, is Neil Gaiman, who is with us. I vanished mysteriously for a few seconds, um, but I'm back. Um, I discovered Diana at about the age of 17. And it was a paperback copy of Charmed Life in Puffin edition, I think. And I thought of myself as being too old for children's books. So why I had actually wandered into the children's section of the bookshop and why I picked up that book, I still don't know. But I took it home, I read it, and at the end, I was angry. And I was angry that I was not eight. It was a, that feeling that you just read something huge and important and you were too old for it to have changed your life in the way that C.S. Lewis had changed my life, that Tolkien had changed my life, that, that P.L. Travers had changed my life. There, there were people that I'd read and was never the same person after. And uh, hearing Kate talk about reading Charmed Life, I was just so filled with, with joy and envy um, because I thought that was actually what I wanted. And there was there was anger but there was delight in going okay i think there's somebody here who is the real thing and um one thing that you cannot fake in children's fiction is well you can fake it but you can't fake it for very long is a kind of rock bottom sincerity does the person mean it is the person writing this have they seen the sights that they are describing to you? Um, and you felt that Diana had. Um, 
as a very young journalist, um, I then got very lucky because I was reviewing books for the British Fantasy Society Journal, and which meant that I got everything sent to me to read. And Diana's books were exciting. And I also found that I uh, felt incredibly lucky because I was getting them as she was writing them. There was a period of incredible fecundity uh, during the 80s where she was producing essentially masterpiece after masterpiece um, on a level that you look back now and you go, hang on, she wrote that, followed by that, followed by that, and and then Howl's Moving Castle, and, uh, but, and then Fire and Hemlock. Uh, um, I remember reading Archer's Goon, getting to the end of Archer's Goon and just going straight back to the beginning again. Um, partly because I had not understood the final chapter and how it all worked, and partly because the experience of reading Archer's Goon, as far as I was concerned, it was the best thing in the world. I was 24 years old and all I ever wanted to do was read Archer's Goon. Um, years later, I, when, when I met Diana, I talked to her, I remember, about her final chapters. Because I said, I've never hit a final chapter of yours that I have not had to then start thumbing back through the book and figuring out the clues and putting it all into order. And she said, that's because you read like an adult, you know, you don't read like a child any longer. And I said, what's the difference? She said, children read every word and take everything in. Adults assign importance to some sentences or things and they will dismiss things and they don't carry it forward. And I wasn't convinced. And I wasn't convinced until 20 years ago, um, I started reading Diana Wynne Jones, the complete works of Diana Wynne Jones, to my daughter Maddie. And uh, over the course of two or three years, I got to read all of Diana's books. And even books that I had thought were difficult were not difficult. Everything, if you're reading it aloud, you're actually registering every nuance, every tiny little thing from the side character. What is that scarecrow doing in Howl's Moving Castle or whatever? And you, you pick up on things that were obscure. Um, I was always fascinated by Diana's ability to mythologize her life and to mythologize the people around her. Um, I was rather, I, I was, for example, absolutely unconvinced by her travel jinx. She would talk about her travel jinx, and I thought it was utterly fictional until the one time I had to travel with her. Um, she was a guest of honor at a convention in Minneapolis, and I was going out to Minneapolis to attend the convention and also to see my wife's family. And I remember we got onto the plane in uh, at Gatwick. We, we all rendezvoused. It was lovely to see her. We got on the plane. We sat on the tarmac for a bit. They explained that the door of the plane had fallen off. And this didn't normally happen. Um, and they got us all off the plane. And we waited several hours for another plane to happen. And I thought it has never happened before or since to me that the door of a plane had randomly fallen off, large passenger jet. And Diana took it in her stride. And she was like, well, of course, this is my travel jinx. It happens. And from that point on, I, I, was, I was like, OK, well, it may not exist, but I will absolutely believe in your travel jinx from now on because I have experienced your travel jinx. I got to plot with her, um, plot books with her that we never wrote, but we would sit around and plot. And just that experience taught me incredible things. Phoning her, um, back in those days where you would phone somebody that you wanted to talk to, uh, Diana 
did not answer the phone that I remember. Um, but when the phone would be answered, and then a voice would say, Diana, it's Neil for you. And then she would come on. If she did answer the phone, she would answer it incredibly nervously, as if I was about to give her bad news. Um, when she did answer it, we would we would talk sometimes for hours, very often about, and mostly I think, about craft. And what fascinates me about Diana is she gave the impression um, of just being a natural, somebody who came out of the woodwork with all these ideas, with all these wonderful stories. She wrote them down. She sent them off. And there is, and it was a disguise. It was the same kind of disguise that, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen a slack rope walker. Um, they're sort of less flashy than tightrope walkers. And then you try it yourself and you realize that, no, if you get onto this rope, you fall off. And the amount of balance, the amount of training, the amount of craft, the understanding of what they're doing um, is, is utterly there, utterly remarkable. Um, and she made it look easy. And I still think that's why she didn't win the huge awards. Because I look back and go, why didn't you? You were writing books that were undeniably classics. You should have at least won the Carnegie Medal. Not once, but several times over. Um, you should have been lauded during your lifetime in a way that you never were, except you never seemed to mind because you always knew exactly how good you were. And you knew how much better you were than the others. So you were fine on this. Um, but for those of us who loved and appreciated what she did, um, it was, it was or for me at least, it was a source of frustration. And, uh, you know, nobody could have been more pleased for me than she was when I won the Carnegie for the Graveyard book. And by the same token, I'm like, I, you've written things better than this and you should have got this. Um, she was the finest and wisest and most brutal of mentors. Because if I wrote something she liked, she'd tell me. And if I wrote something she didn't think worked, she'd tell me. And, uh, and it made the praise valuable, but, it, uh, but she, she would cushion the cosh in a, in a, if not a velvet bag, at least a hempen bag before she hit you with it. But you knew if, uh, and she would make it very clear. And the, but what she would always come in with was, and you can do better than this and you will do better next time. Um, my final memories of Diana are going and seeing her every time I came to the UK. Um, always because she was getting sick and going down, she had moved her bedroom downstairs. And the last thing, last real interaction we had, um, I got to show her my episode of Doctor Who, The Doctor's Wife, about four months before it actually aired. Um, I, had a, I had a video of it back when we had videos or possibly a DVD, or maybe it was even on my phone and she wanted to see it. And we sat and we watched it together. And she said, you did a good one there. And I was happy. Good, as, as well you should have been. Lo lovely to hear, Neil, thank you. I remember as well, um, you wrote, I think very, very shortly after she died, you wrote an essay entitled something like To My Friend Dinah Wynne Jones. And I remember reading it as, I don't know, I must have been a 13 year old boy and just crying. I mean, it was absolutely lovely um, and very thoughtful and very heartfelt. So thank you for that. And thank you for, for that talk just then. And we, of course, have an even broader panel now because we've got all of them together with the exception of Mickey, I think. But we have Colin and Catherine back on my screen as if by magic. And we also have, there's been a full-blown conversation going on on the right of my screen, which has been fascinating. But also in the middle of my screen, there have been questions 
flying up for the panel. And I think we're going to start with a simple one, firstly, because it's nice and broad, but secondly, because I really, really want to know the answer, which is simply from Carolina to the panelists, which is your favourite of Diana Wynne Jones books and why? For me, probably Archer's Goon, um, because she did things in there that I'd never seen anybody do before. The amount of faith in her audience, the faith in her readership to follow this, the willingness to cross over genre boundaries as if they didn't exist, demonstrating that they didn't exist which she then cheerfully proceeded to do for the rest of her career. You know, you look at Hexwood and it's a fantasy novel about science fiction or a science fiction novel about fantasy in which both are true. Um, but I also have a, a tiny, small, soft spot for The Lives of Christopher Chant, which is an odd one, um, which is because at some point we were talking and I said, you know, I always felt that you nicked a lot of bits from Crestomancy from P.G. Woodhouse's Smith. Um, Crestomancy and Smith seemed to me very much of, of a type. If Smith had actually got a job and run magic, you would have been Crestomancy. And she said, well, yes, Neil, actually. She said, that's actually very perceptive. She said, but in the lives of Christopher Chant, it was you. And I said, what? And she said, oh, yes. It was how I thought you probably were as a child. I said, oh, okay. Which left me traumatized, um, but incredibly fond of that book. That's actually my favorite as well, for the record. The, the image of the sort of stepping stones in the world between the dreams and the worlds and, and the, the kind of netherness that was somehow scary and also welcoming, I just loved as a kid. Catherine, which, which is your favorite? Um... Mine is Fire and Hemlock, I think, although it was now as an adult, I think that is the case. I think the one that I was given uh, Charmed Life by a bookseller who said, this is the best book about magic that is also funny, that has ever been written and will ever be written. And I was eight, so um, I don't think I really had much of a hinterland with which to compare it. And now I go around saying exactly the same with exactly the same slightly obsessive sort of ancient mariner quality. Um, but Far and Hemlock seems to me staggeringly and devastatingly perceptive about the reality of being a teenage girl. I think it is, it goes deep and strange and I love it for its strangeness. And I also think how dauntingly brilliant it is to have been able to take in the rhyme of Tamlin and made it into a sort of odd, vertiginous, half romance, half murder mystery and her, as I said before, her utter willingness not to spell it out, to leave it for you. And so people still fight about that book because it has puzzles that aren't answered in the text. I find that a remarkable thing to have the courage to have done. And I love her for it. I remember Diana telling me, um, I, I, I once said to her that my only dissatisfaction with Fire and Hemlock is I wanted to spend longer in the quotidian reality before we realized that the quotidian reality was not reality and and she said oh yes she said that was how i wrote it she said but my publisher felt that uh it was a little boring so so we cut a lot of that and i was like no no you mean there's there's more and, um, um is there an archive does anyone have the first oh my god well, there probably is somewhere. And, and she also made a career in other points out of um, defying publishers. I remember at one, one dinner years ago, her telling a tiny me and my brother with absolute glee that she'd sent a manuscript of, I can't even remember which, off to her publisher. And a specific page has been highlighted as this is convoluted and it's too much and I don't like it. And going back to Neil's point earlier about she knew exactly how good she was and she didn't particularly care. She said, so what do you think I did, boys? And we said, well, thought you changed it granite she said no i cut all the words up i cut up various different sentences and i stuck them back together with sellotape in a way that made it very obviously look like they've been changed and sent it back and they said it's wonderful really well done um which is about as her as you get i think uh dad which is which is your favorite 
It's right, Fire and Hemlock. <laughs> I think it is a masterpiece, really. I, I just think the way it evokes um, forgetting part of your life and losing where you're going is extraordinary. Uh, and I think the the way it weaves in the story of Tamlin to Bristol is just a, a, an astonishing achievement. And I also think it's it's a book where she um, she looked sort of hard and directly at her own sadness, um, which is why she can convey so much about what it is to be a teenage girl. And I think it's incredibly brave to have done that actually. Um, and it the result is a wonderful book and actually looking at the chat um uh, as it's unfolding there's been a lot of love for the fire and hemlock and i really think that it is it, it is the one i love the other i mean charmed life is a great favorite of mine and and, and the life of Christ christopher Child as well uh but i just think that fire and hemlock is 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 really where she gets lift off i'm gonna have to reread that one i think uh the questions keep flying in jessica asks to neil and to catherine how did diana influence you as writers and what are you grateful that she gave you for me confidence um and 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 a sort of confidence that was wonderful because she believed in me as a writer and took me seriously at a time that I wasn't really a writer. I was, but nobody knew. Um, I published a handful of short stories. I was a journalist. I had an enormous career in front of me. And, but um, the fact that Diana, who was, as far as I was concerned, as good as it got, um, thought that I had the chops and treated me as an equal was like having Dumbo's magic feather. Um, I, I, I knew I could fly and that was, that was huge and important for me. I think um, for me, reading her growing up from such a formative age, a sense that she believed in me as a child, she believes in her child readers. And so you feel that you are stepping into the world of somebody who believes that you will rise to the story she is telling you is an act of such profound generosity. And I will always think that there are not enough people who believe in their readers with quite such vibrant. And also just in practical terms, um, when I was 22, I wrote a novel called Rooftoppers about a girl called Sophie, which is a very slight reference to Sophie in Howl's Moving Castle. And she, a tiny baby drowns and she is rescued by an academic. And the academic is Colin Burrow. So to an extent, there is um, a, a very loosely Colin Burrow and a couple of other academics who I admired wildly. Um, and, and that sort of vision of the way that you might approach literature which is Collins I imagine is also Diane's that's lovely and uh, sadly he's a terrible swimmer just just for the record but I, I'm I'm sure in the fiction he's, he's masterful but in real life it's actually rather disappointing uh lots more questions flying in uh one that I'm particularly interested by is from Yaz asking everyone is there a particular character or characters or scene in any of diana's books even if it's not your favorite that reminds you of her there's no moment in there for me where i i a particular scene or anything like that but is more Diana than anything else, because I think we were incredibly lucky to have this this wonderful fiction that always evokes Diana. Um, a few years ago, my friend Peter Nichols, who was also Diana's friend, who was a critic, um, was had severe Parkinson's, had disappeared off into sort of dementia. Um, and uh, he would go out every morning onto his porch, light these little cigars, and just sit and read things. And he, he took enormous pleasure in reading. And um, 
but had no memory of what he was reading. So he would just sort of sit and read randomly. And I remember staying with them before the end and going out and sitting with Peter. And I just picked up House of Many Ways. And he had a uh, charmed life. And we sat there reading Diana together. Peter, I'm, you know, he didn't say anything, but he was reading. And I was sitting there next to him. And Diana was there. And there was always that feeling of evoking presence. I, it's a very interesting question. And it does make me think about her in quite a radical way because I, I think the answer is well, my answer is I don't think there is a character in her books that reminds me of her and yet all her books remind me of her um so uh, and I think that was part of her actually because she she was really good at looking at people and seeing what they were and seeing through them uh in a slightly scary way sometimes um but I think she sort of almost didn't believe that she was there um so you know in the time of the ghost there's some the, you know there's a, the, the narrator is somebody who possibly isn't there and i think she she thought about herself in that way um i mean the the closest you get to a self portrait really is sophie in in how where you know she had bad arthritis when she was not very old really and and that did mean that she it limited what she could do uh and that and that account of suddenly becoming old and 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 bent over uh was about herself really and, and about um being ill but generally she was she was she was the point of view she was she was the person who saw rather than the person who was in the fiction okay so i don't know if you have any Diana and Jones characters. <laughs> I think that is as good an answer as any, to be fair. The the another question that has caught my eye is from Fee. And this is the sort of, I suppose, more complex inverse of which is your favourite. To the panelists, like many, I was introduced to Diana Wynne Jones' works through Howl's Moving Castle. But what is the one Diana Wynne Jones book you think deserves more recognition? I remember being very frustrated by the BBC version of Archer's Goon um, because it kind of had the plot of Archer's Goon and it had none of the magic. Um, but it, overall, for me, it, it's been a source of joy over the last 30 years, just watching Diana's star ascend um you know she the books get more and more readers the readers the children discover her the the idea you know in in the 80s um when she was writing her works of you know a lot of these works of genius when she was writing fire and hemlock and archer's goon and howl's moving castle and the rest of them the books that were winning awards the the what was fashionable were sad stories about um kids in tower blocks whose elder brothers uh were had a, had a heroin problem um and who were having big problems at school which they may or may not actually resolve by the end um and they were very gritty slice of lifey good for you stories there was a, a sort of you know rather like the victorian morality ones and just the joy of story and things that evoked magic were profoundly unfashionable um and i love you know if, if jk rowling gave us anything it was actually telling publishers no kids like stories and kids like magic and that that actually has had a glorious knock-on effect to Diana because the more people who read them, the more people who 
tell people about them, the more people who pass them on, um, I think is, is huge. Um, I think uh, I've met no one who's read The Magicians of Caprona, um, which is, <laughs> I sure I have now met <laughs> people on this panel and indeed in the chat, but um, I loved it for its sweetness and its anarchy. Um, and I don't think it's her greatest, but I want it to be read and read and read, but I, I'm just going to keep saying fire and hemlock. I also think fire and hemlock because it's not part of the series gets forgotten and people should be talking about it as one of the finest books about a young woman ever written. It should not be put in a, put in a specific shelf in a specific place. It is staggering literature. I'd like to pick up on Kate's point about series because I, 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 publishers love them um, and they can say, you know, this is another World's Crestomancy book, uh, this is another Delmark book, and that does help help the marketing. And that does mean that the, that the ones that aren't part of series tend to be undervalued. Um, and Magicians of Caprona um, is, 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 you know, it's got great cats, apart from anything else. Um, and you know, there's Sienna for you, uh, sort of transformed into a world of magic. It's really extraordinary. But um, I think actually Power of Three, which is quite an early one, and one where she's thinking about landscape and human influence on landscape. And I don't think people particularly talk about it. And I think it's it's slightly dropped out of view. And it's 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 another it's another really great book. I think it is. I, I agree with the Magician of Caprona suggestion. I remember, I think we had that on audiobook and you read it to me and I read it. So Catherine, that's three in one person for a start. Um, but I loved it. I, I honestly loved it. I need to read it as a pseudo grown up actually. Uh, another question from Claire is a very interesting one. The appeal of Diana Wynne Jones's books partially involves how flawed characters grow in organic ways without a single deeper meaning or lesson that dominates the narrative through a unified thematic resolution. I'm not asking for anything as formal as a philosophy of life, which would entirely destroy the charm, but did her approach to daily life reflect a similar openness to disorganized and undogmatic forms of personal group growth. P.S. Hi, Colin from Claire Landis. Uh, well, thanks, Claire. It's, it's great you're here. She's a graduate student of mine who I haven't seen for ages because she's in America. With, uh, Are you not doing your job uh, again? I keep I'm getting people emailing me about that. <laughs> I'm not doing my job again. Lord characters. Um, yeah. It is what she does. Um, and I think she's very, very artful at not um, drawing attention to the flaws in an overt way and very artful about not moralizing about them. Uh, and earlier on in the chat, I think people were talking about Howl and um, how they didn't initially realized that he was quite literally heartless uh, until rereading it. And I think that is that that is part of her skill that she could create these people who didn't know don't know what's wrong with themselves uh, and you don't necessarily quite know what's wrong with them too and and see them growing and i don't know if there's a philosophy of life there i think there is a psychology i think she's very interested in people who don't quite know who they are and that could be a good thing or it could be it could be a bad thing um and I think her view of real people was a bit like that as well, actually, that that she often felt people didn't didn't acknowledge what they what they were for good or for bad. Uh, so it's a big part of her writing. And, and I think it is more a, a psychology and a sort of writerly practice than it is a, a sort of straightforward moral philosophy that you could state in precepts about human behavior. But I, I think probably Neil and Kate will have more more insights on that, that question probably than I, than I will. Let me toss it to Kate first, because I want to think about it. I think insofar as it's about how she lived, of course, I 
very sadly never knew her, but I think the way in which her characters do have these flaws in them that are different from the flaws of classics children's literature, both in the baddies and the goodies. For instance, the baddies in Charmed Life being sort of quite shoddy and seedy rather than just straightforwardly um, fairy tale wicked. I think that is one of the things which suggests that when you enter a Diana Wynne Jones book, you enter a world and a world with texture and opacity rather than just moral lessons. And I know that when you write for children, the temptation to tell them something morally important becomes very strong. And I think the way in which she resisted that was both beautiful and offered a, 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 a sort of model for the people who came after her that you didn't have to essentially say sit down be quiet thin and extremely well behaved i think that um the joy for me of her characters is they were people and you it, it feels as if you would know them if you met them. Um, very, very few of them feel like characters. Um, they, and they're all broken. Um, and they're all broken in interesting ways. And some of them will mend themselves and some of them will not. Um, and they all have, you know, your, your, your protagonist always needs to understand who they are. And the, you know, the biggest question of most of the books is going to be, who are you? Um, I'm trying to think of a protagonist there are very few protagonists who know who they are at the beginning. And sometimes that's very literal. They, they, they believe they have one set of parents and they don't. They believe themselves to have one identity and they're wrong. They believe themselves to be a specific kind of thing and they're wrong. Um, and I sometimes wonder if that's because, you know, Diana used to talk about the fact that her mother defined her and her sisters. They were all sort of, they were given roles that they were expected to conform to. And she always felt that she, she'd sort of broken out and done the wrong one. Um, and I don't know to what extent that, that feeling of figuring out who you are, defining who you are, and finding out who you really are and where you come from um, moves through everything. But, it's, but it is there in every, you know, it, if not in every story, in all of the major ones. Um, you know, looking at something like Enchanted Glass, where you really don't figure out who everybody was until literally the final page um, is, is quite astonishing. So much of her work ends up feeling like that, I think. Um, unfortunately, this is the stage in proceedings where I have to start being my boring radio presenter self and start looking at the clock and think we've got a couple of minutes. We have got a couple of minutes, uh, which is not long enough to do a whole question in loads of depth from all of you. So what I suggest is there's a great one here from Taya. Can we talk about the humour in her work from slapstick to satire brackets huge? I know humour in her work humor in her life. I mean, I remember learning to swear straightforwardly from hearing her swear playing cards prodigiously, often directed towards my mother with love because mum is probably watching. Um, but she was funny. She was a funny person. She was an extremely funny writer. One line, one moment from each of you, just as a final takeaway of either in print or out of it, when she just made you laugh. I love the moment um, in one of the Crestomancy books, I think it's probably Charmed Life, where Crestomancy sweeps out of the room in a very long one-person procession. It's just so great. She's just so brilliant. I'm reminded, um, I, 
one of the lovely things about um, the the uh, fantasy book that Kate was talking about earlier, the Tough Guy, was that um, a lot of that I had heard as rants, incredibly amusing and wonderful rants. And her rant about Stu was so much better because her rant about Stu points out how long and complex it is to make stew. The fact that stew is something that has to be attended or um, it has to be stirred. Everybody has had the, the experience of turning their back on stew to answer a phone call. And then you come back and there's a layer of blackness on the bottom that permeates the entire rest of it. So the capacity for stew to go wrong. And she did this entire speech about just in conversation about people in fantasy making stew with ease. And then she said, nobody ever makes an omelette. <laughs> she said, you could make an omelette so easily. There are birds' nests everywhere. Why don't people in fantasy make omelettes? And I don't think I've made an omelette since without thinking <laughs> of Diana and the stew and the omelette. There's a lot of love in the chat for, for her food, which is wonderful. Uh, going right back to Eight Days of Luke and the, the monochrome meals that get served there. Uh, the, the bit, I've just been rereading The Pinho Egg and, and actually the Griffin, Clarch, and uh, Clarch sort of learning to walk and learning to be a Griffin just is so, it, it has her humour because it's so warm about a creature that doesn't, know yet what it is you know it's about to become this great vast terrifying creature and yet it's still just a puppy it just falls over its own feet i think that is for me the core of her humor actually it's, it's a humor of, of, of warmth about things that don't quite understand themselves yet yeah and and equally that idea of a thing that doesn't quite yet know what it is being central to the rest of it as well not just the humor but but the whole thing guys it has been such a pleasure to to speak to all of you this evening Catherine Rundle Neil Gaiman Colin Burrow uh, did such a great job a real moving funny interesting heartwarming conversation which I have absolutely loved thank you to everyone who has kept possibly the most populated chat section I've ever seen if I got texted on radio shows at this kind of pace I would never have to think ever again uh, thank you of course to Bristol Ideas all of the organizers so many wonderful people uh, have been behind this Laura Cecil Catherine Butler Henrietta Wilson Lydia Wilson all kinds of people behind the scenes as well just doing sensational things all of your questions uh zoe steven mill running things so many people behind it so many people have enjoyed it i hope remember it is all being recorded if you missed the beginning if you missed the end if you want to watch it again if you want to watch it again but edit colin out so many options uh it's all going to be available for you and of course the bristol festival of ideas many many more things coming up throughout the autumn online and in person so subscribe on all the relevant social media keep an eye out uh Keep reading, keep thinking, keep laughing, uh, and keep enjoying the work of Diana Wynne-Jones. Thanks. <laughs>